It feels like a whole year has gone by uh, and there is so much I'd love to share. Uh, I do see our role in these open briefings as acting as a, an opportunity to share things with you all. Uh, we, we really want to make sure that we give you access to whatever information we can get and also that we use it as an opportunity to discuss tricky issues that are cropping up uh, because there are many of those. I'd like to try to keep that going, but following the survey that TWE has, 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 has organized, I think there may be one or two other things that we will change. I thought as we start, it'd be really nice to invite TWE just to give us a little flavor of what she's found and uh, also what that's meant for her. If she doesn't want to talk too much about that, I quite understand. I know, Twee, uh, you, you normally like to keep pretty quiet, but I just thought you might like to say a word or two about that. I'd also like to give a very special shout out to Chris Shipton and to the whole of Live Illustration. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for coming back again for Series 3. And uh, uh, really, I just can't find enough words to say just how brilliant your work is. A special shout out also to Vicky Doyle and Nazim. Nazim sent a phone recording of his latest work, which is absolutely brilliant. And I feel it'll be a fabulous song for which to just start off 2021. Um, uh, and Twee, perhaps you could talk a little bit about how we'll be able to help people access that, or Vicky, you might want to. Uh, and then I'm going to offer you the structure of today's briefing. Last point, one or two of you mentioned in the survey that we have a terrible habit of running over time. And uh, I'm going to say to Twee and to others, let's pull the plug after an hour. It's not fair to overrun. Uh, and, and one's always worried one's going to miss something. So we will be a bit more disciplined on time. Twee, over to you for any thoughts about the survey, please. Thank you, David. I did meet the survey. So thank you to those of you who completed the survey. It's been really helpful as we, uh, as we prepare for series three of these open online briefings with David. So I'm going to launch a poll now. And this poll responds to a couple of uh, comments that you guys made. Uh, one was around the poll being a bit repetitive and maybe we could consider mixing them up a little bit more and then sharing the results with you afterwards, which I can do on the LinkedIn community chat. And then secondly, some of you wanted more practical advice, um, a bit more hands-on. So I think this upcoming poll, which is like a quiz for you all, uh, answers a couple of those two questions, which I'm gonna launch right now. So the first question is, on your screen, you'll have a window that pops up. In relation to the World Health Organization's MOOCs, what do you think MOOC stands for? Question two, how many people have enrolled in the COVID-19 open WHO courses in 2020? And then how many course versions are there and how many languages are they in? So I'll leave that open for a few, for a few seconds while you answer those. It's anonymous, so absolutely okay if you don't get the right answer. And then I'll explain a little bit more what this is about. So we have six respondents so far. Twelve. Do you want, do you want to add anything about your the survey results that came through from the survey you did at the end of last year? Was there anything in there, Twee, that surprised you? A couple of things that I really loved was um, was that a lot of you said that you enjoyed the chat. Uh, which, which is an unexpected uh, thing that people love. And it's uh, in the beginning, I recall, sort of John, Catherine and I trying to boost and get the chat going, and now it has a life of its own. Uh, there were a couple of comments that people did enjoy the chat being private versus uh, what you say on the video goes into the recording. Uh, so that was well noted as well. But as some of you learned later in the series last time, you can actually save the chat. So next to that, there's the three dots and you can save it to read later. There'll be links there and that sort of thing, which I think is really useful. Um, one other thing as well, which you might have seen in the newsletter that we sent before um, earlier today to tell you about the meeting, 
uh, where some of you were interested in writing blogs or thought pieces with us uh, about these briefings or about other topics um, that sort of develop in these briefings. So I do openly invite you all, if you're interested in writing a blog that we can publish on your behalf on the Foresty website, you're very, very welcome uh, to write to me about that. Um, a few other uh, suggestions for the series, but I think we'll save those as we develop those ideas um, here and then we can share more with you next week. So for now, I can say we do have 28 80% respondents. So I think that's enough for me to end the poll and share the results and give you the answers. So indeed, most of you got it right. MOOC in relation to the World Health Organization does mean a massive open online course. The WHO massive open online course is called Open WHO. And in 2020, 3.9 million enrollments of the courses took place in relation to the COVID courses. And that was actually the third response right there. So very, very impressive. And then number three, how many course versions and how many languages they are in. It is actually option number one, 149 versions of the courses in 45 languages. So if you're interested in having a look at those courses, you can just go to openwho.org and those uh, courses are targeted at frontline um, health workers, but there are many, many interesting other courses there as well. If you're interested, please go there and have a look. Thank you very much. And over to you, David. Thank you very much indeed, Tree. Oh gosh, aren't I lucky to be working with such an amazing group of people and one of the points that came out in the survey results very much in here was a uh, real respect for the back end. And I think the more we do in life, the more we realize that it doesn't work without having a strong foundation and a good back end. Uh, and that's what we've got here. So Twee, who, who is just amazingly in the middle of the back end of so much of what we're doing, uh, has just once again shown why it's a joy to work with her. Actually, we have several of our, our team on the call today. I do want to welcome uh, them here and uh, use the opportunity to give a shout out. Charlotte Dufour is here. She's, she's been with on a few of these before. She's actually right at the center of our work on uh, the Food Systems Summit, organizing dialogues. She's a person who uh, I've known for years and has worked on the interface between agriculture, food and nutrition. Uh, with a lot of experience in Afghanistan. Noemi Blazkes is here. Noemi is uh, working as our uh, um, special uh, assist, executive assistant and um, uh, is just really now quickly become so central to our operation. John Atkinson is here. John is giving us such a lot of guidance on systems leadership, particularly living systems leadership. Uh, with John, we're just in the process of actually trying to extract some of the lessons that we've learned from year one of COVID and to offer them to everybody as to what are the kind of management and leadership skills that seem to be really important for dealing with this kind of issue. We've learned such a lot. Thank you, John. Uh, to, um, to Kath, Kath Deland, here right next to me. And, and Kath is acting as our senior public health advisor. We've just had a most intriguing interaction with Ted Ross, the Director General of WHO, uh, in which we've been actually trying to take his mind, haven't we, Catherine, and just feel what, what, what's going on. I'm gonna share one aspect of this discussion with Ted Ross today. It's very relevant to what I want to discuss with you. Um, goodness me, it was interesting. And also to feel just how much he wants to work with us and now, five other envoys, another one's just been uh, appointed to bring it up to six again, uh, Alita Abikun from uh, Sri Lanka. And it was quite interesting just to feel how much for Ted Ross, having a string of envoys does an awful lot to help him find his pathway and uh, hold on when quite honestly, he's being buffeted all the time. Laurence Lasben, my partner and the managing director of 4SD, Thank you very much for being on and um, uh, for all you do to make this work possible. 
uh, Julian Delamontex, who's part of the COVID team, who's a member, as we told you before, of the uh, local administration in uh, the commune near here that includes Flynn, a ski resort. He's having to deal with incredible challenges from his local community because the ski resort is shut, it's in France. And then Marlene Schuppbach, who is right at the center of our food work, Swiss, and who is also keeping me very, very closely informed about the quite interesting challenges between the Swiss Federal Council, the Swiss cantons and the Swiss communes uh, as to how they deal with COVID in Switzerland. Not an easy challenge given the, the way the country is governed. It, just, we, I won't do this every time. I just wanted to pay respect to them as we start our work in 2021. Very, very keen that we do use the chat box fully. What happens is that the team monitors what, what's in the chat box and then sends me messages, but it doesn't, that the team doesn't send me just exactly what you put in the chat. It comes as suggestions for ways to string the conversation together. They also look very carefully if there are people putting their details in the chat who've got something they want to say. And so if you've got a point you want to make, do please make sure that it's in the chat and please also show how you believe it can be linked to other issues. Here are the headings that I propose to use today and they're headings that I will almost certainly come back to uh, week after week as we go through series three of the briefings. These are headings which we believe capture a lot of complex challenges uh, and we would like to dig into them in more detail. At the beginning, we're going to focus on the virus and people. And that's going to be right at the center of our briefings uh, for pretty well every session. The virus is a, a, a cunning and quite difficult adversary, and it therefore is really important that we try to understand what this virus is doing in societies around the world. And people are the solution. And so it's important that we understand what people are being able to do and how they're doing it and in particular, how they're making sense of this virus and the challenges it's causing. So the way in which people are making sense and the way in which the virus is causing challenges, I present them really as two sides of the egg because I don't honestly think there's anything very good about this virus when it comes to the future well-being of humanity, unless the virus actually helps humanity to turn the corner and uh, really get much better organized when it comes to some of the things that we've got to try to deal with. So I will continue to present the virus as an adversary, adversary and also present people as the solution. Uh, and I will use that as the very top. I'm going to continue to share with you insights about what you need to control an infectious disease. And I will keep coming back to the basics of infectious disease control because my colleagues and I think more than ever right now that it's this lack of clear understanding of the core elements of infectious disease control that is causing a great deal of difficulty in governments all around the world. Not every government, of course, but many governments are finding it super hard to hold on to the core principles of controlling infectious diseases. So let's just come back to that again and again. We sometimes call it public health. We sometimes give it other names. Today, I'm talking about infectious disease control, which is the control of infections, and it's a particular series of skills. So uh, we will be reverting and referring to that quite a lot. Heading number four, I'm going to use the broad title of systems. Obviously, there's a vitally important set of systems for providing care for people who are sick. The clinical care systems, that's hospitals, health centers, 
all sorts of other institutions that fundamentally exist to cure people who are sick, to stop them from dying, to deal with chronic ailments, to reduce disability. We will be talking about those systems a lot, but we'll also be talking about public health systems, which are the systems in the community that are so vital to be organized. We'll be talking about incident management teams and systems for dealing with big outbreaks. We'll be talking about food systems, because unless food systems function, people go hungry, yet there is real damage to food systems as a result of COVID. We'll be talking about a lot of social systems, particularly the social protection of people who lose employment or who find that they just cannot get cash. We'll be talking about actually more generally employment systems. And what we're gonna to try to do all the time is to share with you our understanding of how systems in society are being deviated or in some cases actually damaged as a result of COVID and the way in which COVID is being managed. But also, if you want to mend the systems or change the way in which they behave, you have to involve yourself in the political process. You have to understand the symbiosis between different systems. You'll recognize here that there's all the stuff we depend on John to help, with, help us with. Right now, we are seeing a lot of systems in a lot of places seriously overloaded, Perilous, perilously stretched, and in the views of many commentators, at risk of collapse. We're going to talk quite a lot about what that really means. You know, do systems actually collapse? Do they just stop? Well, I suppose in certain circumstances they do, but mostly what tends to happen is they struggle, and they struggle with overload, they struggle with uh, challenges because they've got insufficient personnel, and we'll be looking at some of the ways in which the various systems on which humanity does depend for equity, does depend for opportunity, does depend for rights to be realized. We're looking at those, we'll be looking at those systems and applying a living systems perspective to them. My fifth heading is tools. We're going to be all the time talking about the kind of tools that are becoming available in order to help these systems to work more effectively. We're in real difficulty because of the tools to diagnose COVID, depending all the time on tests like PCR to find the virus. What about these new tests, the quick new tests that we've all got hope about, the antigen tests that are being talked about and that are being marketed, used in the White House, but unfortunately not able to prevent the Rose Garden outbreak of last year. Uh, are these rapid tests still going to have value? Are there new rapid tests likely to come on stream soon, which will be available in the millions or even billions per day and enable uh, populations to be much clearer on what's happening to their, to their COVID status? Well, let's talk a bit about that. And, and we've already had discussions with Henk Beckerdam and others in these briefings on uh, some of the challenges of testing. But what about treatments? Colleagues were saying to me just recently, just today, you know, it's all very well talking about ways of dealing with COVID, but if you can't treat people and give them a chance of survival, particularly if there are low cost therapies available, it's very, very difficult. And we, we do have uh, our, um, dexamethasone. There are suggestions that ivermectin is gonna have a role. There are various other treatments being talked about. So we will keep a focus on treatments. We will look at tools with regard to organization like apps and so on. We'll be continually looking at ways in which the system overload could be eased by tools. And then heading six will be vaccines. We'll be talking about the different kinds of vaccines that are coming available. We'll be talking about the different vaccine rollout strategies that are being used. We'll talk about vaccine nationalism and vaccine equity. What are the prospects for enabling all people of the world to be, to be able to access vaccines in the foreseeable future? It's a huge issue. And it's something that I'm sure many of you will want to talk about and already got some hint of that. And then we will talk about leadership and communications heading seven. Uh, that's because without good leadership, there is 
really going to be huge challenges for this world in extricating itself in a decent way from this pandemic. But the leadership's no good unless it's backed up by really superb communications. And we will be continuing to look at that. So here are the seven headings again. One, the virus, what's it up to? Two, people, as the, as the really, really good solution to the problems caused by this virus. Number three, infectious disease control or public health, whatever else we want to call it, as the, the, the mainstay of dealing with the outbreak. Number four, the systems on which societies depend, the systems that are uh, in difficulty and overloading, let's look at some of those and consider what kind of living systems leadership is needed to help them to get right. Number five, tools coming on stream, tools available, tools that we need. How can we be really looking in more detail at being systematic about that? And that's, of course, an area where we may, from time to time, need to call upon some super special experts to come and get, bring us bang up to date. Six, vaccines. And today, I'm going to spend a bit of time focusing on vaccines. And seven, leadership and communications. Those are my basic headings. And uh, then I'm going to go into some of the detail. Number one, the virus. Uh, I've been asking myself, what is going on? Can, I've been asking myself, can I explain it to everybody? Uh, and, and I've been looking for the right words. I'm still wanting to use the following words to describe how this virus behaves in society. Spike, swirl, and surge. I've been to adding this swirl word, word quite a lot recently. Uh, I, I was really trying to think very hard, well, what is the best set of words to describe what's happening in Western Europe right now, what's happening in the US right now? It certainly spikes because it tends to start up an outbreak in, in a very small area and there is a sudden cluster of cases. And so the spike concept, I think, is a reasonable one. Swirling is a word that I'm using to describe, to describe the fact that at various points in outbreaks of COVID, you see what appears to be quite a buildup of virus activity in a geographical area, as though different spikes are coalescing together and uh, forming a, a, a major problem. And then you get a big surge, sometimes a ferocious surge, when it appears that cases are building up uh, very, very rapidly. And of course, if this change and, and evolution of the virus is associated also with some kind of variation in the genetic makeup of the virus, then the swirling and the surging might take place at a far more rapid pace. Everybody knows here that viruses mutate all the time. You've got in somebody infected by COVID, you've probably got millions of viruses moving around. They're dividing all the time. There will be constant mistakes in the divisions that will lead to mutations. Most, most, most of those mutations will actually result in the virus dying and uh, they will have no impact. They just are part of the wastage that occurs in virus multiplication. Very occasionally, there is a change in the genetic makeup of the virus, which changes the property of the virus. We call that the emergence of a new variant. One particular variant emerged in the UK, or at least it was defined in the UK and was discovered in the UK. But as with all these viruses, you'd never be quite 100% certain that that's where the virus was actually made. It could have been made somewhere else. But this strain B117, a variant that emerged in the UK, uh, as everybody knows, uh, seems to have about 75% greater transmissibility than the original version, which means that straight away it's got an advantage at having a higher R0, uh, infecting more people, 
And of course, that is a big worry. It can change the dynamics. And this B117 uh, seems to be associated with a really massive jump in case numbers in the UK, taking us up to these very large numbers of cases each day that we're seeing, possibly 20,000 more per day. Uh, is that right? Oops, I might have made a mistake there. Anyway, big numbers per day increase on where it was about two weeks ago. Uh, and um, this variant, the same variant, is present uh, not just in the UK, but is being found in many other parts of the world. The thing is to have the capacity to sequence the genetic material in a virus and to work out whether or not there's been a mutation requires a pretty sophisticated uh, laboratory capacity to be able to do nucleotide uh, uh, assessments. And so uh, my colleagues continue to say to me that we can't be absolutely certain that this was born in UK, but anyway, it is becoming known as the English variant or the UK variant. And uh, when people say to me, David, are you worried? My answer is I'm worried because viruses mutate all the time. And the one thing you always worry about when dealing with viruses is, is you're going to get the emergence of something that's more pathogenic, more transmissible, leading to nastier disease, difficult to maintain, to control. So you've always got nervousness that the virus is going to be more difficult when it's mutated. Uh, usually if a virus causes much greater mortality after mutation, quite honestly, it tends to die out. So a virus which probably has the same degree of pathogenicity, but is more transmissible, like this B117 appears to be, uh, those are the viruses that tend to take hold, the mutations that tend to take hold, and this is what seems to be happening. I'm, I'm predicting that this uh, variant that we've seen come in the UK will become quite widespread. No reason why it shouldn't. Uh, and, and I'm also anticipating that it's already quite widespread in Europe, despite the efforts of various governments to block transport out of the UK and so on and so forth. But there's another variant that's appeared in South Africa, multiple mutations, uh, more transmissible. Again, most people think it's not more pathogenic. Um, I think it probably has originated in the African subcontinent and anyway. Uh, similar multiple, multiple changes in the genetic makeup of the virus. Uh, so this is also concerning. It's most unfortunate that this has led to uh, a, a, a kind of interruption of transit from South Africa. Uh, you know, you always get nervous when these decisions are made to cut travel links, that this is not just about trying to uh, restrict movements to the virus, that there, there are other geopolitical things going on. Uh, anyway, it's a bit unfortunate, that one. Um, my colleagues tell me that both these variants, the UK variant, the South Africa variant, represent quite a lot of change in genetic material. And they're saying perhaps these variants have happened in a situation where somebody has been immunocompromised, not perhaps having their full capacity to defend uh, against the virus uh, because of some immunodeficiency. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know why people are saying it, uh, but I just wanted to share that with you. There's a third variant that I've heard about. Uh, uh, that is one that appeared in Denmark. We discussed it before. That appears to have been associated with passage of the virus into mink and then back from mink to humans. Uh, there's been a big culling of mink in Denmark, quite a political mess, really, because it uh, didn't go quite uh, according to plan. Uh, the reality is that that mink-related variant seems not to have taken hold. Uh, so right at the moment, we're mostly looking at the so-called UK and the South African variant. But I'm telling you that I do believe there will be more and more of these mutations and variants emerging. Uh, they will cause a lot of uh, uh, anxiety. My own view is that what really matters is that the variants are not associated with making the virus resistant to the antibodies that are associated with the vaccines that are currently being administered. And I was delighted to see yesterday and today an increasing number of reports, not yet peer reviewed, but an increasing number of preliminary reports saying that most of the uh, 
currently uh, uh, being used vaccines are actually able to neutralize the uh, mutant or variant strains of, um, of uh, uh, COVID-19. So uh, hope all fingers crossed on that and uh, we'll have to keep looking at it. Uh, somebody said to me uh, this morning, well, where is this virus? Is it, is it just really causing trouble in the US and Europe? Uh, is, it, is it still looking okay in the rest of the world? And I just have to say to you, uh, that unfortunately, this resurgence or surging, uh, often associated with a lot of swirling, is occurring all over the world. Russia, more cases, more deaths. And that also includes countries around Russia, including those in Central Asia. In Latin America, Colombia, picking up again. It was already having a lot of difficulty last year but Colombia, disease and death on the increase. Similarly, Mexico. Moving further into, obviously, into the North of America, the United States still very serious with a major incident in Southern California, particularly in Los Angeles County, where things have got particularly, particularly intense. And that's one thing I want to, 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 to point to you, that within each location where you've got surges occurring, you also get quite massive major incidents occurring from time to time in quite tight geographical areas. Uh, the Southern California one is particularly intense. And we have members of our team with family who are coming from Los Angeles, who are giving us very graphic illustrations of what that means. Canada, parts of Canada also much more intense than was expected. Of course, all of Western Europe in difficulty, but the situation in the United, United Kingdom is particularly graphic. Uh, we think mostly because of the uh, new variant being so dominant. Uh, other parts of Europe also not in, in comfortable situation. Uh, and, and you just have to look at the situation in Germany, in Netherlands, in Italy, in Spain, and also in Switzerland, all of which are experiencing quite dramatic increases, and in some cases, uh, serious overload of their systems. Going into the Middle East, Tunisia is reporting quite significant increases. Going towards uh, Africa, uh, South Africa is reporting increases, but listening today, to our colleagues who are working in Africa, particularly our colleague Samba So, who is the WHO envoy based in Mali. He was saying, actually, Africa is getting, gonna get hit much worse in what they're calling the second wave now than it was in the first wave. That's very disturbing indeed. And South Africa is, uh, Jane Badham, you're on the call. You will know that the situation is not so good uh, and also, uh, parts of uh, other other countries, including Kenya, I heard to Miles and to uh, Joe Nichols uh, that Somalia has got uh, some places that are showing increased uh, incidents as well. If we go to East Asia, countries that we've been holding up as examples are now facing some difficulties. It doesn't mean they are unable to cope, but they are struggling. South Korea has got quite a lot of struggles. Tokyo still trying to get ready for the Olympics, but there is actually a, a major problem in Tokyo City. And I understand, I don't know whether that's true, Catherine, that the government has called a state of emergency over the situation in Tokyo. Indonesia, are very, very difficult. I was talking to colleagues from India, and they think the situation is mercifully not so bad in India. Uh, they, the numbers are low, and also the percent positivity rate on the testing is low in India. Uh, similarly, for some of the countries close to India, Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, not so good at the moment, Pakistan, not so good either. So the situation in South Asia is patchy. Overall message I'm trying to communicate, and it's not nice, is that this resurgence is happening globally. It's not just in Europe or North America, it's everywhere, but it's super patchy. It's not 
in each single locality, you've got the same pattern emerging. And as we dissect out and look at the figures that are reported to WHO, we know they're not totally complete, but we also know that there's an awful lot of good base to them. It's still a very, very mixed picture. What it does mean is nobody can let down their guard. And so now we come to heading two people. Want to stress that we believe there's remarkable sense-making going on everywhere, in every country. We think that most people, a very large majority of people, are doing everything they possibly can to be responsible for preventing the spread of this virus. They've got the message that it's a combination of physical distancing, face protection using decent fitting masks, self-isolating when you are sick, quarantining yourself when you might have been in contact with people who've got the disease. Very, very good personal hygiene, hand hygiene, cough etiquette, sneeze etiquette, and of course, at all times, uh, practicing surface cleanliness, and then maintaining decent ventilation, trying not to be stuck in confined areas with no ventilation at all. People are taking it seriously. There's a much greater recognition that long COVID is serious, affecting one in 20, to one in 30. It's global, and nobody knows what the medium to long-term sequelae of these long COVID uh, incidents are. Will they be associated with other conditions? I don't want to go on about it. We have long COVID people who join these calls. Last thing we want to do is to start speculating. But the reality is that there is some long-term physical damage to membranes in people with long COVID. COVID is making poverty deeper. We've got to get the language right. We've got to be able to explain it. Perhaps we need to be even more precise. COVID is making the poor poorer. And we've got to really bring that out. And we've got to stress that poor people don't go around with labels on them saying how poor they are. There are no neat indicators of poverty that you can pick up just by looking at somebody. We like to try and we think we can, but we can't. And so actually working out what COVID is doing for poverty is something that we've all got to be alert to. And it's not just those who shout the loudest. We pick it up when we get data on employment. We pick it up when we get data on hunger, data on malnutrition, data on the difficulties that poor people are having with paying their rent, data on abuses, data on people being taken away because they're not able to meet their obligations. And we have to link that with the other sequel of what's happening to people as a result of COVID, which is increased mental distress. We know that, we've got masses and masses of data on it. And of course, the frustration that builds up that all of us are feeling, myself back into lockdown again, my family back into lockdown, many of you back into lockdown. None of us enjoy it. We're social creatures, most of us, huh? most. And we need to be able to to communicate and we need to be able to feel that warmth and that friendship and to hug and to smell each other. And it's so difficult to do that if we're asked to be in isolation. So I'm saying people are doing great, but I'm also saying the cost is huge for humanity, huge. And the, the cost for people who are already poor is massive and they do not have an easy way to express this. So uh, you all know this, I know, but I just feel that we have to keep, keep putting out the word that COVID is making poor people poorer. Of course, there's still this really awful situation, not my heading three, that most leaders have not got the message that the way you deal with a problem like this is you interrupt transmission. And so all the things we've talk, been talking about, about detecting and then uh, testing, and then isolating, and then tracing contacts, and quarantining the contacts, which we know, and everybody who's working on this knows, is the key to keeping ahead of the virus. That's how 20-plus countries, particularly in East Asia, have done so well. 
and why they'll continue to do well is because they've focused on transmission interruption. That message is not getting through to too many people. They still are seeing COVID management as a choice of either people being able to move around or people being told that movement is restricted and they are to stay put at home. That rather awful term, lockdown. Lockdown does not get rid of the virus. Lockdown freezes it where it is. You get rid of the virus by interrupting transmission, by detection and isolation. I have to keep going on this. I have to keep going. I have to keep going. And I, I've decided that to actually talk about uh, in control of infectious disease rather than public health may be better. Fourth point about systems. Well, I've already talked a bit about it, but there is stuff in newspapers everywhere about overload and stretch of, of healthcare systems. I've mentioned Los Angeles. I'm going to talk about uh, UK a lot now. We've got very graphic stories about uh, uh, the health system being overloaded. What are the sort of indicators? Cues of ambulances trying to discharge their patients in an accident, an emergency department in a major hospital. If you've got 30 or 40 ambulances queued up, you know there's a problem. Or staff just not able to, being asked to work even though they're supposed to be in quarantine because of COVID. That's a bad sign. We were hearing today about an infectious care, sorry, intensive care unit. There are normally three consultants on duty, hearing of a hospital with 10 consultants trying to provide intensive care support. What does it do? It completely sucks up staff. You can't possibly put all the staff in. So what's happening in Los Angeles? There are instructions going to ambulance drivers on patients they should not be bringing into hospital for intensive therapy because they don't have much chance of survival. This is tricky stuff, and it's going on everywhere. It's triage on the move. It's signs of overload. It's signs that the systems is stretched. But it's not just clinical care that's stretched. Public health, professional health, public health and infectious disease control professionals all over the world are stretched to the limit. And uh, some would say they're near breaking point. But yes, although we know that sometimes when you're feeling stressed, you do reach a breaking point and you break down. For most people, what happens is you just become less and less effective because you're more and more exhausted and upset. It is a big issue. Uh, social protection is being stretched. There are more and more people who can't get the social protection they need to, to get the food they require or the funds they require. Uh, education systems are stretched. We've got parents finding homeschooling increasingly difficult, schools unable to manage uh, distance learning. So system overload, system stretch. In some cases, system collapse, the vital need for long-term living systems leadership right at the center. I've talked a bit about tools. I'm not going to say much more. I'd like to ask Catherine, if she wouldn't mind, just to give us just a few minutes tutorial on where we stand on the vaccine. And I'm passing the mic over. And Catherine, I'll put my mask on. Sure. Um, so just a little, a little update on vaccines. Um, everybody will be familiar with the ones that are being rolled out in their local communities um, if you are in a community with where they're being rolled out. But first was Pfizer, of course. That's the minus 70 mRNA vaccine. Um, and its uh, sort of sister vaccine is the Moderna, more expensive and less common vaccine. Um, we're seeing a lot of those in Europe and in the US, both of those and uh, have been purchased by a number of other countries. Um, the other vaccine that is, is out there is the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine, which is much more shelf stable and has been largely used in the UK so far, but I think it's gonna, was approved recently in India. So I think we'll get rolled out there and we'll, I think it'll even be produced in India, which is gonna be great. Um, there's a couple of others, three others that I'm aware of that have been, have gotten far enough to begin being used. One is the Sinopharm vaccine that's being used in China and will go uh, also over a number of African countries have ordered and it will be moved uh, through Afri African countries. Um, there's also the Sputnik Russian vaccine, which is a moderate, moderate modified, uh, modified virus vaccine. And that's being used in Russia at the moment, even though we don't have a lot of data on it. And apparently Bolivia has bought, and has bought a, a number of, uh, some millions of it. Uh, 
And then the last one is a is a one that was developed and is being manufactured in India. We have no data on it particularly. It's an inactivated virus vaccine, um, and they're using it in India. But uh, there is some controversy because we don't have third uh, stage trial data yet. So that's that. I think you know one of the things that was said on the call with the envoys today that you might find interesting is that 42 countries have begun vaccinating people as of as of yesterday. And of those countries, 36 of them are high income and six of them are high middle income. So right now, what we're looking at is a map of rich people getting vaccinated and poor people not. And my guess is that if we further refined that map, that, that map, that even in the wealthier countries, you see that kind of uh, stratification as well. So I think one of the things that's really important, in addition to knowing a lot of the technical side of the vaccines and working on, on building vaccine trust, is to remember that the most vulnerable don't just include health workers, it also includes people who live in close quarters, people who are poor, people who have to go to work. And we really need to protect them. I think that one of the things that WHO says all the time, uh, and I don't always agree with everything WHO says, but in this case, I really agree with it, which is that we aren't protected until we're all protected. Um, and I think we really, really need to remember that and think about that when, when we look at this. One of the things that's happening now is that there's engagement on the WHO side with some of the manufacturers to donate, <coughs> excuse me, donate some of their production. I don't think I've talked this much to people all day, <laughs> to donate some of their production capacity to WHO to distribute, <coughs> pardon me, um, and then additionally to uh, talking about wealthier countries that have purchased a bunch of vaccine to also donate that to the COVAX facility. <laughs> so apparently I'm gonna lose my voice in the one time I'm speaking to people. Um, anyway, if anybody has any questions about vaccines, put them in the chat, I'd be delighted to answer them. David has just left the room and I can't speak. Twee, can I, or John, can I hand off to you for a moment? Of course, John, over to you. <laughs> okay, I'll pick up on, on the unforeseen circumstances that, that we've got. David was running through a list of seven things. His fifth was tools. His sixth was vaccines uh, that Kat just picked up on there before her voice disappeared and has been recovered in a, in a glass of water. And the seventh was leadership and oh, communications. Okay. David, I'm just sort of holding the space, but you're uh, welcome to hand that back to you or I can keep going entirely. Thank you, John. I just, uh, we just got a bit of water. Uh, good. Bad, yeah, yeah, it happens. Uh, want to give a, a couple of uh, final points on vaccines before we open up. Number one, it's most extraordinary thing going on. Never seen anything like it in my life. Governments are competing with each other for how many people can receive shots, as it's referred to, uh, within what period of time. The vaccination program, as far as I'm concerned, is not just about shots into people's arms. It's about the people themselves. If I'm interacting with people about vaccination, I want to be able to connect with them as people especially as many of them have some misgivings about the speed with which the vaccines are being developed. If everything is just turned into a production line of just finding as many people as possible and sticking needles into their arms so as to get numbers up to the level that politicians have promised, I don't think that's going to help anybody. I'd much rather see a clear, well-organised, uh, properly implemented plan for immunization, just like what we've done for any other campaign that I've been involved in in my life, in which the people who are being vaccinated are the stars. The other stars, the co-stars, are the people whose job it is to assemble those who are being vaccinated. It's never an easy job to assemble, especially if you're assembling older people. And then you also need to have part three, a very good logistical system, especially if your vaccine needs to be kept at a, a, a very cold temperature. And you need beautiful record keeping 
because when you've got vaccines on emergency use authorization, it's absolutely essential to know who has received which batch of what vaccine, just in case any problems do emerge, then you've got to be able to get back and find them. Just suppose one of your batches turns out to be dud. You need to be able to find these people so you can revaccinate them. Otherwise, you've just totally uh, misrepresented what you're trying to do. And I've been involved in situations where I've seen dud batches. It happens. They've been exposed to heat or just for some freaky reason, they were, uh, the, the vaccine was not potent. So I'm saying to people, this is not simply a league table about which prime minister can demonstrate they've got the most people vaccinated in the shortest possible time. No, this is a program that requires incredibly effective organization and implementation where you need to focus on the interests of the people being vaccinated, the personnel whose job it is to do the vaccination, and in particular, that's bringing the people together, reassuring them, taking them back. There's often very long waits in vaccination clinics. Thirdly, it's about the logistics, which are really complex. And fourthly, it's about record keeping. And I'm sure each one of you will have other things in your lists. So, I'm, I'm trying to get this right. And what the most important thing I'm saying is, look at the USA, who have two amazing five-star, three, four-star generals who are responsible for the rollout of the vaccine in the US. But their sole responsibility is to get the vaccine to the states. Then the states are responsible for vaccinating inside their states. And so you've actually got a patchwork of what's going on, and it's all muddled. And I don't think that's right. I think inside a country, everybody should know what the vaccination strategy is. And it should be the same for everybody. And I actually think that there should be a strategy for the world. Because like Catherine, I do not believe it's right that <laughs> there are vaccines that are available to deal with this virus are just going to the countries that happen to have more wealth. It's just wrong. And so with Tedros today, we were thinking through two different scenarios for the future. One is where we go on as we are at the moment. There's a mad scramble for vaccines. Four countries buy or try to get access to Chinese or Russian vaccines that have not gone through their phase three trials yet, but they're cheaper. And rich countries get these nice synthesized mRNA vaccines from Pfizer and BioNTech or from Moderna, or the, the middle group get the Oxford Astra, AstraZeneca vaccine. Is that the world we want? Is that how we want the response to the pandemic to be remembered? One of astounding inequities. Or is it possible that Johnson, who's chair of the G7, could on the 21st of January be contacting Mr. Biden and saying, come on, let's get the G7 together now. And let's ask ourselves, what can we do to get a global master plan for immunization in which each country has a chance? Let's get the 5 billion that's needed for the COVAX facility to be properly financed. Let's bring in presume the CEOs of all the major companies. Let's talk to them about getting a fairer distribution. And let's do it now. So that actually when the history book is written, it won't be a stupid scramble where a few countries were able to immunize all their people and jump up and down about it. But the rest of the world was left unvaccinated just at the time when an absolutely massive surge of COVID is building up. What a way to be remembered for our generation. And Tedros sees it even more explicitly. He said today, this is a really dangerous divide. And he said, we've got to deal with it. Anyway, so we're working on it. Thank you very much, everybody, for comments. Uh, just, um, uh, I'd like to actually read some of the things that you've said, because I promised we'd finish on time. Annie Beltham, in local briefing, says Annie, 
she heard that there are so many people in hospital and that parts of London are calling what they've got happening a major incident. There are issues with frontline staff illness, threats to health service, and it's close to being overwhelmed. John Atkinson, what are you picking up uh, from your contacts throughout the health service, particularly in the UK, about how systems are being stretched? What do you think this is going to mean? And uh, what advice would you give us? So what we've seen in the UK is a very rapid proliferation starting on North Kent, spreading into Essex where Annie is and around London. But if you watch the um, distribution graphs across the country, you're seeing that spread up the sort of M1, the big corridor of, of, of people that takes it into the Midlands and now into the northwest of England. So we're seeing that spreading quite rapidly. And with that, we're seeing hospitals very rapidly becoming really quite full and working at the limit of their capacity. And what we see, what we see always in this is, is the, the points where people are concentrated. So lots of people end up coming to hospitals and we see queues of ambulances, but that's indicative of a whole system under stress. It's indicative of, of problems going through GP, through public health, all the way through. And the things that we need to do well, we need to, to take responsibility for ourselves. We need to keep doing the basics right. If we're in quarantine, we need to quarantine. If we're in a high tier uh, in the UK, we need to follow the rules that are there. We need to do everything to take the pressure out the system at the, uh, you know, at the beginning of the process, which goes back to your comment, David, about just doing the basic you know, infectious disease control right and making sure that we look after the people who are under most stress in the health system. John, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that this phenomenon of stretched and overloaded healthcare systems is growing and will become quite widespread in different parts of the world. It's also clear that an awful lot depends on us as individuals in uh, reducing transmission because using lockdown as the strategy to try to reduce transmission has its limitations. Jane Badham says that things are tough in South Africa. Thank you, yes, Jane. Um, I mean, I picked it up as well. But you also made the point, Jane, which I've heard from many South Africans, that the government has reached the limit on the degree of harshness of the restrictions that it can put in place. Quite simply, because it's clear that any further harsh restrictions will just make poorer people much, much poorer and find it harder to get food and find it harder to look after their children or other relatives in the household. Jane, yourself, you're self-isolating, but I, I think we need to be clear that there is no, there's, sorry, that there are immense trade offs associated with lockdowns. The tougher the lockdown, the more damage to poorer people. And although I'm really understanding why many health professionals are calling for tougher lockdowns in many parts of the world, I'm, I'm actually not, not keen to be promoting it. Just a couple of quick things before I close. Um, Sihaj uh, Sharma asks for thoughts on trained innate immunity. I'll have to look that up. I'm sorry, I don't know anything about it. Yusuf Gottlieb points out that the variants that are now associated with COVID in Israel uh, are actually apparently more easily transmissible among younger people leading to higher infection rates. Uh, the WHO technical team are still waiting for absolute precision on this. They are beginning to reach that conclusion. Uh, they've told me that they're not yet ready to say it for certain, but this is of course extremely disturbing. And we do have colleagues working in clinical care in Europe who are saying to us that actually the levels of illness among younger people really are building up. They haven't got uh, good quantitative community-based data, but
but they've got data from hospitals saying that there's much greater uh, um, COVID, uh, there are much larger numbers of people with uh, children with COVID in uh, hospital, in many hospitals in Western Europe. So Yusuf Gottlieb, Gawaha and Rebecca Cantor, thank you so much for sharing things on LinkedIn. To Twee, is there anything else you'd like to say at all? Uh, just to say, we'll be uh, alternating the times. Next week will be 8 a.m. Uh, Central European time Friday morning. Uh, so that's 7 a.m. for those joining from the UK. And if you allow, David, I will uh, spotlight Chris's illustration. Yes, please. Chris, would you like to uh, come in and say anything? Beautiful. Um. Oh, I haven't thought of anything to say, apart from um, I've drawn a picture of JVT uh, in the COVID briefings that the government do, they call him uh, JVT, so that's Jonathan Van Tam, he does a great train analogy from time to time, but um, it's, it's good to be back on these calls, but there is part of me that thinks I'm looking forward to when we don't have to do them anymore, whenever that may be. Oh, Chris, we are so indebted by the brilliance with which you turn our words into structure. To everybody who's joined, we're glad you're with us. Uh, we'd like it if our news could have been just a bit more optimistic, but we discussed it amongst ourselves. We said, at least at the beginning, we need to tell you where we think things are going. We haven't given up. We continue to be stubborn optimists. We believe that humanity will come through this bruised, battered, and hurt, no doubt, but stronger. And there are other really massive political issues being unveiled in different parts of the world right now in real time. Let's hope and indeed link arms together to try to usher in a more promising and equitable future in 2021 and beyond, even if the beginning feels a bit rough. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks to everybody in the team. Bye-bye.